here in Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. Let's just follow me down to verse 13. It says, not that I speak in regard to need, and he's talking about a gift that the Philippians had just sent to him. He said, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So as Paul is expressing his appreciation for the gift, he turns his attention to the subject of contentment. And as he speaks about contentment, he's, he's talking about it from a personal standpoint. This is what it looks like for him. This is, this is how he wants to express it to them in this, in this wonderful gift that they have sent to him. Not that I speak in regard to need, because I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. Contentment's a major subject in the scripture, even though the word doesn't appear many times, it, it really, the, the thought and the, the um, idea of contentment is there. So as I thought about contentment, I also thought that maybe we need to start this with some foundational work and that's what this message will be. It'll be more of a foundation of, of this subject and not so much an exposition of this text. The opposite of contentment is discontentment. You know, the word, that word doesn't appear in the Bible. The commands to be content assume that we are going to be tempted not to be content and that maybe we are often not content and discontent so we need to be told to be content. So as we address discontentment this morning, I want to begin by defining what contentment is and how it is used in Scripture, and then, then we'll get into the uh, idea of discontentment and what it is and where it came from and why it's so prevalent. So first of all, what is contentment? What is contentment? Well, let's look at the meaning of the words uh, this is from Webster. Content means happy enough uh, with what one has or is. Not desiring something more or different. It means satisfied. Contentment means a satisfying or being satisfied or something that satisfies. Discontent is, of course, the opposite. It means dissatisfaction, a restless desire for something more or something different. Contentment or discontentment, as you look at the definitions, you realize it's an internal thing. It's an internal desire. It's something within us. It's, it's not so much something out here and something that's happened to us or or whatever, it's, it's a, an inward desire in the way that we respond to the things that happen. So we are either content or discontent depending on what's going on in our hearts. And as you're gathered here this morning, and as I'm here this morning, I'm either content or discontent. You are either content or discontent, and it's in your heart. It's in your heart. It's what's going on in here. Now, obviously, this desire is going to shape our speech. It's going to shape our decisions, our attitudes. It's going to shape our perspective, and it's going to shape our behavior. It's going to have an influence on everything we do and everything we think. So let's see what the Word of God has to say. Let's see the message of the Word what does the word of God have to say on contentment and discontentment? Well, the Old Testament, the, in the Old Testament, the word contentment is not used. And the word content does appear five times in, in the English Bible, at least in the New King James. But in the Old Testament, it never appears as a commandment to be content. However, the concept of contentment is there in different forms. Uh, for instance... When God judges the children of Israel for complaining about the manna, 
what he, is, what he is telling them basically is, I am judging you because you're discontent with what I provided for you. And although the words aren't there, the exact words, the concept is there. Now in the New Testament, we are commanded to be content. And I want to look at some of these. First of all, Luke chapter 3, verse 14. Uh, This is John the Baptist speaking, and uh, John the Baptist has been uh, preaching the gospel of repentance. And so as he's been teaching about repentance, uh, people have come up to him and said, well, how do we apply this? How how do we repent? Well, a group of soldiers, it says the soldiers asked him, these are Roman soldiers, asked him saying, and what shall we do? How do we repent? How do we show our repentance? So he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. Ah. Be content with your wages. That's what he tells them. Now, from, from as I looked at this and studied it a bit, it, it appears that what he's saying previous to be content about your wages, do not intimidate anyone. The idea is not to intimidate anyone in a way that you get money from them. Or accuse them falsely in order to get a bribe. But be content with your wages. What I want you to see is that being content with their wages was at the heart of obeying those other commands. If they were content about the, with their wages, they wouldn't need to intimidate anyone to get money. And they wouldn't need to accuse falsely in order to get a bribe if they were content with their wages. Contentment was at the heart of this call to repentance. Repentance. Because it is a hard issue. And our hard issues affect everything else that comes out of us. And so if they learn to be content with their wages, then they would also learn not to intimidate people and not to accuse falsely. And so it would affect their, their behavior by being content. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, we also read again about contentment. In fact, it it goes on right down to verse 8. We read this this morning where he says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain because you brought nothing into this world and you're going to carry nothing out of this world. Everything in this world that you have, everything that you've accumulated, it's all temporary. It's all part of of living here, but it's not part of living there where you live forever. It's, It's only temporary. So look at it as temporary. See it as temporary. Live like it is temporary. And, and, and don't make that the most important thing in your life. Make important godliness and contentment. That is more important than the things that you accumulate in this life. And verse 8, he says, And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Again, in Sunday school this morning, we're, we're on the subject of worship and uh, how much that um, it involves. It involves everything in life. And we ask the question, what, what do we need? Not, you know, what is essential for life? What is essential for life? Well, there's a lot of things in life that are really nice to have. But they're not essential for life. Paul basically gives us here what is essential for life. Food and clothing. Would that be content? And he's saying this in relationship to money. 
Be content. The previous verse in Luke is about money. Be content. Be content. So if you have the basics of life, the basic necessities of life, be content. And then he goes on in verse 9 to speak about the dangers of discontent. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. There is a danger in discontentment. The danger is a snare. The danger is many foolish and harmful lusts. And men have ended up in hell because of it. Because of discontent. That's what he's telling us here. And in verse 10, he tells us, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Love of money. Not content with your wages. Not content with what God has provided. It can lead many astray. And even astray from the faith in greediness and pierces them through with many sorrows. Listen, money is a pretty poor God to worship. We have a, we have a better God to worship than money. Amen. No man can serve two masters, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. And he contrasted two gods Two masters, God or money. Well, the Bible says a lot about money because money is something that very easily can grab our hearts and it can be an object of worship in our lives. So contentment deals with money and things or at least is reflected in money and things and what we have, but there are some serious spiritual consequences to a love of money, a discontent with what we have. In Hebrews chapter 13, in verse 5, contentment is mentioned here. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The writer of Hebrews is giving us a contrast here. Contrast between covetousness and contentment. They're they're opposites. So covetousness is a lack of contentment. It's discontentment. Contentment is the opposite of of covetousness. This kind of broadens our understanding of what contentment is and what discontentment is. Because in Exodus 20, verse 17, in the, in the last of the Ten Commandments, uh, we read this, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So it is, it is all the things that your neighbor has you shall not covet, also his wife, that relationship you shall not covet. This broadens our understanding of what we are to be content with and, and what discontentment affects. It's the opposite of coveting anything that is my neighbor's. That's what contentment is. The opposite of anything, of coveting anything that is my neighbor's. And the reason that we are to be content in this verse, we are to be content because God will never leave us and he will never forsake us. That's the reason given here that we can be content. So if God never leaves and he never forsakes, then we can always be content. The potential is always there because God is always there. He's always with us. Uh, We who know him have believed in Christ and been saved. 
So contentment and discontentment is, is directed toward God and our understanding of God and our relationship with God. So from God's perspective, contentment is vital. It's vital for our spiritual health. And Paul said of contentment in Philippians 4.11, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Contentment is something we need to learn. It doesn't come natural. It doesn't come natural to uh, the human race. It doesn't come natural to uh, fallen man. In fact, true contentment is impossible for the fallen man without Christ. Secondly, first we saw what is contentment. Secondly, the pervasiveness of discontentment. And I want to, want to take you back to Genesis 3 and look at the origins of discontentment. Now, do we ever experience discontentment? Thanks, Bob. <laughs> you spoke for us all. Do we experience it occasionally? Or maybe um, often? Or maybe always? Is it stirring in your heart right now? As we're here and as we're looking in the scripture and speaking about contentment, is it there? Do you sense it? Do you want to be content? Do you want to be content? I, I get thinking about this. Almost every decision we make is to find satisfaction, contentment. And yet, many of those decisions that we make do not find that satisfaction. They do not find that contentment. It's because we look for contentment in all the wrong places. Right. Why does contentment seem so hard to find? And it is. We live in a very discontented country. Do you know any contented people? Honestly, do you know any contented people? If you do, they're rare. <laughs> very, very rare. But we are commanded to be content as God's people. So where does all the discontentment come from? Well, I'm glad you asked. because it comes from Genesis chapter 3. So I'd like you to turn there. Well, it, it'll also be up here. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, describes the fall of man. A fall from a position of fellowship and intimacy with God to being dead in the trespasses and sins. Discontentment all started at the fall it came through a temptation from the original discontented one, that is the devil. So I want you to think about what's going on here in Genesis chapter 3. Before we get to this portion where it speaks about the temptation, the serpent was more cunning than the beast of the field, any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? I, I, I want you to think about where Adam and Eve are at this point. They're in paradise. It surely would be a paradise to us if we could get there. Every need that they had was provided for in an abundance. Everything. Everything. They had no dangers to fear. Nothing to hide from. 
they enjoyed an open and honest relationship with each other. Adam and Eve did. And with God. There was nothing hidden. And God had also provided for them a clear boundary. You may freely eat of all the trees of the garden, except the tree that is in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. That was God's command. Life for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden before the fall was simple. It was uncomplicated, and it was pleasant. It was filled with pleasure and no disappointments. It was satisfying. And along comes the serpent. Along comes the devil through the serpent, the discontented one who wants company. When you're miserable, you love company, right? You want other people to be miserable along with you. He also hated God. He hated all that God stood for because God is the one who stood in his way from him being God, and that's what he wanted. So the goal of the serpent here is to get Eve to believe the lie of verse 4. You shall not surely die. That's the lie he wanted Eve to believe. You shall not surely die. So he wanted, his goal was to get her to see that eating the forbidden fruit was what was best for her. And to convince her that only she could determine what was best for her. That was his goal. So as he enters the picture here, and he meets Eve in the garden, or she meets him, he begins a conversation with her. Now I want you to, to listen to the means of the serpent. We saw his goal. Now look at his means. His means was to subtly, so discontent through complaints against God. You remember we, we talked about this a little bit in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, where Paul instructed them to do all things without complaining and disputing. And this is where complaining started. It started here, Genesis 3. And the first complaints were complaints against God. And all complaints reflect on God. And so he, the serpent subtly was sowing discontent. Now this is, this is quite a quite a project here. They're in paradise. All their needs are met. They've got everything they could possibly want. They've got these wonderful relationships with, with God and with each other. How, how do you sow discontent in a, in a place like that? Well, what he did was to direct her attention away from God's good provision onto what God had forbidden. So instead of being thankful for all that God had provided and looking at God as, as being so good because every need is met and this is a beautiful place. What, they, what the, the serpent was trying to do was to direct her attention. Oh, yeah, it may be a beautiful place and you got all this, but what about this tree? Why is God holding this back from you? See how subtle that is? And even, even the way he says it, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? God didn't say that. God said, you shall sure, freely eat of all the trees of the garden except this one. Subtly, sowing discontent. You, you see, there's something missing here, Eve. God's, God's holding it back from you. 
and it's what you really need. This was his means. And so then he reinterprets God's goodness. God's goodness that, that had provided everything for them to make it appear selfish. As if God was withholding the best from them. Particularly from her. And as this goes along, he is seeking to convince her that she should be discontent. <laughs> because there's one tree that God has withheld from them. And this tree will give them something that is desirable that they don't have. And so he is drawing her attention to what she did not have and how necessary it was for her happiness. That's the deception here. But the power of the deception is in the discontentment. He has to get her discontent before the temptation can take effect. In Every temptation we face at the heart of the temptation is discontentment. Get it. Every time you're tempted, you're tempted to be discontent with what God is doing, with what God has provided. You see how important this is? This, this is an aside subject somewhere that, that's, you know, good to know. No, this is at the heart of all that goes on in our lives spiritually. Discontentment. You see, once she's discontent, she's susceptible to believe the lies of the serpent's temptation. Now notice the direction of the discontentment. Eve became discontent with paradise. <laughs> you get that? She became discontent with paradise. She became discontent with the situation she was now in and, and all this fruit that she could freely eat. She, she became discontent with it. <laughs> because she felt like she needed more. The key word there was needed more. She needed something different. There was something being held back from her. But the discontent primarily was a discontent with God. The direction of discontentment was against God. And in every temptation that we face, the direction of our discontentment is with God. And that's why it's so major. The direction of our contentment is toward God. And the direction of our discontentment is toward God. Think about this. With Eve, God had given her life. She wouldn't be there. She wouldn't be alive without God. God had given her this beautiful garden to live in where all her needs would be met in a, in a super abundance. And here she is, looking at the one who gave her life, looking at the one who has provided the garden and, and all that was in it, had provided a partnership with Adam that was, that was a beautiful, wonderful relationship because there was no barriers, nothing that, that would hinder that relationship from being all that it was to be and satisfying, who had provided a relationship with God, so there was an intimacy with God. Abundance of food. It was all good. And it was all satisfying. Her every need was met. Even the desires of her heart were fulfilled in a way that satisfied. Because her desires were good. This was before the fall. Yet even in that paradise, she was de deceived to think 
she could not be content without what God had forbidden. God was holding it back, discontent with God, because he's holding this back from me and is what I really need. Let me ask you a question. What is God holding back from you? I want you to think about that for a minute. What is God holding back from you? Is there something that you really want, something you really desire, is a powerful desire? Okay, if God is holding that back from you, do you think he has a good reason for that? Do you think it's not only a good reason, but it's what is best for you? Wasn't it best for Adam and Eve to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Wasn't that the best thing for them to, be, to, to stay away from that and not eat it? That would have been the best, right? It would have been best for them just to be content with what God had provided, it, the, the abundance and the paradise that they lived in. It would have been the best if they had been content with that. I like, what, I like what John Piper says. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. That's contentment. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. You see, the real object of Eve's discontentment and ours is God. Is God. When you are discontent, you're discontent with God. Because he could make things different. But we don't glorify him. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. One of the primary ways we do that is with discontentment. We, we don't glorify God with our discontentment. God is glorified with our contentment, our satisfaction with him. but we live in a race of discontents. They're all over the place, <laughs> even in church. Sometimes in our home, in our own body. But God desires better for us. There is an answer here. What is the answer for con discontentment? What is the answer for discontentment? Well, I want you to see contentment displayed in the person of Jesus Christ. In uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, Jesus, after his baptism, hearing his father say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, and the dove landing on him, in the person of the Spirit. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Here Jesus is tempted, like Eve, like Adam back in Genesis 3, Jesus is being tempted by the same tempter, the same subtle tempter. But the condition that Jesus is in is far different than the condition they were in. From a human perspective, Jesus had every reason to be discontent. He was hungry. And most of us get pretty discontented when we're hungry. It's also interesting that, that both of these temptations start with food. <laughs> food has such power over us, it seems like. So here is Jesus. He's in a wilderness. He's not in paradise. He's hungry and without food. He's not living in a garden where there's an abundance of food. He faces the same tempter with the same subtlety, with more reason to give in to the tempter than Eve had. First, I want you to notice that he, he tempted 
Jesus with food. This is the lust of the flesh, verses 3 and 4. Now when the tempter, it says when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Command that these stones become bread. That was quite a temptation. He's hungry. He's hungry. And what the devil is telling him is that Jesus, you have the power. If you're the Son of God, you have the power to turn these stones into bread and eat. You're hungry, so why do you stay hungry? You can satisfy that hunger with this bread that you make out of these stones. He's tempting him to be discontent with his circumstance, hunger. Discontent with how his father has led him to the place where the father has led him, to the condition now that he's in because of where the father led him. He is tempted to be discontent with the provision of his father, discontent with God, his father. That's the temptation. And so the devil starts the same place he does with Eve, trying to sow discontent in Jesus. And Jesus' response to him, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He says to the devil, food's not the most important thing. Food's not the most important thing. We don't live just by that. We live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's an interesting statement. You live today by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God said, let it come forth. He breathed life into man. We're alive today because God spoke it into existence. God spoke us into existence. And so the very word of God is why we have life. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. Here it is in the scripture, the, the, the Bible, is, is, are the words of God. This is every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What God wants us to hear, what God wants us to know. And Jesus is saying, we live by that. And so if according to the word of God, And what God has provided, I do not have bread. I'm not free to take matters into my own hands and to provide bread for myself in a way that dishonors the word of the Father. Instead, he trusted his Father's word. He trusted his Father's promises. He trusted his Father's goodness to fulfill his needs. God had led him to this point and he knew what his needs were, and he trusted the Father for his provision. The second temptation, he was tempted with the pride of life. If you are the Son of God, takes him up to the pinnacle of the temple, he said, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. (laughs) For it is written. That's interesting. He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. All right, Jesus, you you quote the Bible to me. You quote the word of God to me. You say you shall live by the word of God. Well, here's the word of God. I'm going to give you an opportunity to show that you believe the word of God. Pretty subtle, isn't it? He quotes it back to him. The devil knows the Bible better than you do. He quote it back to you in his temptation. If you're the son of God, if you believe the promises of God, then prove it. Do something spectacular. Then everybody can see how great you are and how much faith you have in God. If you cast yourself down because because God has promised, he'll he'll bear you up. His angels will, will catch you. And you won't fall to the ground. He's saying to him, don't be content to wait for your father to work for you. 
Don't wait for your father's timing. You can take matters into your own hands and get this thing moving here. You've just been baptized and it's time to get on with your ministry. Well, think how spectacular it would be to start the ministry this way. Look at the crowds you'd gather and everybody would be buzzing and talking and wow, wouldn't it be great, Jesus? But it's not what God wants because Jesus correctly understood the misuse of God's word when he said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. That would be tempting God. It would be wrong for me to do that because it would be tempting God. The third temptation was directed toward the lust of the eyes. Verses 8 through 10. The devil takes him up into a high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and he says, all these things will I give you if you'll fall down and worship me. I'll give it all to you. You'll have the kingdom. Over in Revelation we read, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. The kingdoms belong to Christ and all the glory of them. They belong to him. They're rightfully his. But there's a way that God has designed for Jesus to receive that kingdom. And it wasn't this way. The devil's saying, listen, Jesus, you can have it all now. You don't have to wait. You can have it now. I sound familiar? <laughs> all of our shortcuts when the temp- tempter comes, all of them are, are, have it now, have it now. You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait. See what you can have? Look at these kingdoms. Look at them all. The Father's holding it back from you. But I'm, I'm here. I'm on your side. And I want to give it to you right away. Yeah, you're, you're worshiping the Father. All you have to do is switch loyalty and worship me. And you can have it all now. You can have it all. And, and not only that, but, but think what you have to go through in order to get it. Think, think of how difficult life's going to be for you. Man, a sorrow's acquainted with grief. You're going to have to suffer. You're going to have to die. You have to go to the cross. Listen, I'm offering you an alternative. You don't have to do that. You don't have to suffer. You can have it all now. Father's holding back on you. (laughs) Sounds familiar, doesn't it? But Jesus was content to trust his Father to know what is best, to trust that his Father had the right plan and the right purpose and the right timing for it all. He trusted his Father, and he said, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. There is something more important than entering the kingdom, than receiving all of this, than seeing all of it and, and having it all now. There's something more important than that. And what is more important is the will of my Father. What is more important is the glory of my Father, the plan of my Father, the will and, and wisdom of my Father. That is what is most important to me. And so Jesus' chief concern here was to glorify his Father. How could he do that? By being content with his Father, with his Father's will. Jesus lived a life of contentment in his Father's love, a life of contentment that completely trusted and obeyed his Father's will, even to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He alone, out of the whole human race, he alone lived a life of contentment. He alone has contentment to give. You can't find it anywhere else. It's in Jesus that you find contentment. Contentment is possible. Contentment possible. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What happens when a person is born again, when they have trusted in Jesus Christ alone to save them? They have then become a new creation in Christ. Things have changed on the inside. All right, the heart's changed. The Spirit of God's come to live within you. Things are different now on the inside. And what is different is you've received the Spirit of Christ who knows contentment, who has contentment, who lived a contented life. Christ did. And that Spirit now has come to live within you. Contentment is possible. But we still must understand that we are, we still have sin within us and we still struggle with our flesh and all that we receive from Adam. Adam's nature is a nature of discontentment. It's been passed on to the whole human race, all but Jesus. Because he was born of his heavenly father. But now that we're born again, we have a nature after Christ, a nature of contentment. But it is impossible for humans to be content. The only way we can be content is through Christ through Christ. He is the only contented one. And I know that even we who are born again, we struggle with discontent that comes from our fleshly desires. And I understand that because I struggle with it too. It's a common human experience. But I want to encourage you because one day, we know, we have the hope, one day, we will be in a place where we will be fully content. Amen. We do. We'll get there, folks. Isn't that good news? We'll get there to the place of full contentment. And this lifetime is a lifetime of preparing for eternity, preparing for that contented life by learning to be content now. And it's a learning process. And it takes time and it takes effort and it takes focus on what's really important. It takes knowing who God is and trusting Him to live out contentment. And I want you to see this morning just how important contentment is and how our discontentment is against God. It is an offense to Him in a direct attack against him and his goodness. And I know most of us here, we, we're not criminals. We haven't committed any major crime. You talk to the average person and you tell them they're a sinner that needs to be saved. Well, I'm not so bad. I've never murdered anybody. Well, you can be pretty bad without murdering somebody. But anyway, that's usually what, what people say. Well, let me ask you. Have you been discontent? That's where the first sin started. <laughs> That's where it all started. Have you been discontent? Then you've, you've committed a major offense against God. But Christ is the answer. Christ is the answer. He's the only answer. I'm looking forward to one day being fully content and in this lifetime, I've learned at times <laughs> to be content. But without him, it would all be impossible. We come to Christ for forgiveness of our discontent. We come to him to receive a new life. We come to him in faith to trust he is the only way to know God and to be what God originally created man to be. He's the only way. And there's no hope without him. You long for contentment? It's found in Jesus. And when you're walking with him and when you're obeying him, there is contentment. And there will be a fullness of it. 
when you leave this life and go to glory. I tell you, we have extreme riches in Christ. The things that we really long for are only found in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the word of God. Thank you that, that you have the answers that men and women everywhere are searching for, but searching for in places where they, it, the answer can't be found. The answer always comes back to Jesus. He is our only hope. And I pray that you would open the eyes of any here who are without Christ, that they would see in him the only means to contentment, the only means to be fulfilled and to have a relationship with God, to have my sins forgiven, everything that's a barrier between me and God removed, reconciled to him forever, but only through Christ. So Lord, I pray that you would search out our hearts and help us to see the areas where we're discontent and how offensive that is to God. And teach us, Lord, to be content in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, please stand with us as we sing one more song to close out this morning's service.